Well, throughout the scriptures, you see the um, Holy Spirit give us examples of um, good churches and bad churches. And if you want to see an example of how churches act, uh, there's probably very other, other place that's better to turn to than Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. In those chapters, there are seven churches that are profiled. Some of those churches are good. Some of those churches have some rough edges, and some of those churches are outright terrible. These seven churches are literal historical churches. They were in Asia Minor of the time, that is modern-day Turkey. They are mentioned in chapter 1, verse 11. We've spoke of them already, and they were the ones that were the original recipients of this book that we call Revelation. What I'd like to do, if the Lord permits us to do so, is devote one week to each one of these individual churches and learn and grow from the comments that God spoke to them as we apply his comments to them to us today. This man was a member of the 1984 Olympic basketball team in Los Angeles. He was drafted by the Chicago Bulls with the third overall pick that year, and he was fresh out of the college in North Carolina. The man's name we know is Michael Jordan. It was an exciting time for the young athlete. Just graduated from college, signed a very lofty contract with the Chicago Bulls, and was now about to represent his country in the 1984 Olympics. The only difficulty about what he was about to undergo was that his coach was none other than Bobby Knight. Bobby Knight is the, or was the legendary coach from Indiana University. Tremendous coach, very successful coach, but if you know one thing about Bobby Knight was that he, um, let's just say he liked to yell a lot at his players. Very demonstrative. Sometimes he was even physically physical with his players. And a microphone was placed in Jordan's face, and uh, at that time, young student, 22 years old, roughly or so, mild-mannered, and said, well, how do you work with a guy like Bobby Knight? And Jordan's response was classic. He simply said this. He said, I watch what he yells at other people for, and I simply don't make those same mistakes myself. (laughs) And that's kind of what I want to do over the next seven weeks. I want to look at these churches and see what they did that got God upset and learn from their mistakes so we don't make those same mistakes ourselves. The first church is Ephesus. Ephesus is going to be a negative example. And that's why the study of history is profitable, because it teaches us that we can learn from the poor decisions of other people so we don't repeat their mistakes. This church in Ephesus had a lot of good things going for it as well. We'll cover those. But they had just one problem. And this just one small problem was so big in the mind of God that it almost prevented them from ever becoming a church again. So that's our goal, to identify what that one problem was and to see how we as a church are doing in that particular area ourselves, okay? So here we go. First point, I'm calling it Christ control. You can see it there in your sermon outline. Let me read for you again verse 1. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands. So right from the beginning, we see that this letter is addressed to a specific church, and the church is located in a town named Ephesus. Let me take you very briefly to the ancient city of Ephesus. Back during biblical times, Ephesus was a seaport, and it was the most thriving seaport, most important seaport in all of Asia. And because it was a seaport, like most seaports back then, it received tremendous trade, tremendous travel, but because of all the trade and the travel, you had a lot of shady characters that would oftentimes pass through and temporarily live within that town. Ephesus was a place that harbored criminals, a lot of pirate activity as well. It was also a place that was engulfed in deep, deep immorality. As a matter of fact, the immoral activities in this, this town in Asia were so prevalent that they were actually considered at times sacred. Prostitutes were viewed as priestesses. And if you were in Ephesus and you looked up on the hill, dominating the landscape of Ephesus was the Temple of Artemis, the Greek god. The Temple of Artemis was four times the size of the Parthenon in Athens, and it was also one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Ephesus and 
Acts 19.25 in your Bible is identified by its own people as the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis. They called Artemis the image that fell down from heaven. That was their primary source of worship. In Acts chapter 19, verse 26, Artemis is described as the great goddess in whom all of Asia and the whole world worship. And it was to this pagan town, to this hostile town, to this immortal town, that God in his great sovereignty chose to send the Apostle Paul and his delegates back in A.D. 52. And as you know, according to Acts 18 in your Bible, Paul and his friends ministered in Ephesus for a solid three years sharing the gospel. And then a remarkable thing took place. That in this awful town, the book of Acts tells us that a church was born. A church was born. And that church is confirmed to us now in Revelation chapter 2, verse 1. Some 40 years later, after the Apostle Paul planted a church in Ephesus, we still read about that same church still alive and doing well, for the most part, in Ephesus. They were a church. And it says that in verse 1 of chapter 2, to the church that is in Ephesus. The Greek word for church is ekklesia. It's a compound word. Ek means, it's a prefix meaning out of. Klesia is from the verb kaleo, meaning to call. It's a great word when we consider this particular situation and most churches for the most part. That in the midst of a dark, perverted, pagan society, God called out people to himself. God regenerated souls, called them to Jesus Christ, and a church was alive in the pagan city of Ephesus. God called them. God forgave them, God sustained them, God nourished them, and this church was in existence, as I said, for about 40 years when the letter of Revelation was written. The answer is found again about who sustained them in verse 1, that it was Christ. He's the one who holds the seven stars. We covered that in chapter 1, verse 20. The seven stars are the seven angels that oversee each respective church. And the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, the lampstands, according to 120, are the churches themselves. That Christ established his church. He's in complete control of this church. He has protected this church. He has exercised divine authority of this church. He displays a vital concern for this church. It says in the text that he walks amongst the lampstands, that he's presently within the church. He's personally concerned about what happens in the church. He's not on the outside of the church. He's in the midst of the activity of the church. He's intimately involved in the affairs of the church. The institution belongs to him. What happened for them is true for us today, and that serves as a tremendous comfort. But it also serves as a sober warning that we are accountable to Jesus Christ in everything that we do. So let's go to Christ's control, the second point. Or from Christ's control, let's go to Christ's commendation, the second point. Verses 2 and 3. He starts off by saying this, I know your deeds. In other words, he's walking amongst the lampstands. The lampstands are the churches. He knows everything that is taking place within the church. There's nothing we can do here at Grace Bible Church that will ever confuse Jesus Christ. There's nothing we can do. There's nothing we can even think within our hearts that catches Jesus by Christ by surprise. An overarching statement, Jesus says, everything that is going on in that church, I know of it all. We call that his omniscience. And he's going to tell the Ephesians multiple things that they're doing very well, he starts off with. First of all, he says, I know your toil. NIV, I think, translates that, I know your hard work. Kapos is the Greek word. It's uh, working to the point of exhaustion. It's wearisome labor. Uh, Tenney describes it as grueling toil, uh, something accomplished with a hard struggle. Basically, he's saying is, is, is true what is true for all Christians, that, that if you love Jesus, you should be serving him faithfully. And to serve Jesus faithfully is hard work. And Jesus starts off before he gets to the negative by saying, the first thing I see about you that I really like is that you guys are working hard. You're doing a good job. You're not taking your life with Christ half-heartedly. You're not using your gifts only when it's convenient. You are serving the Lord faithfully. You are working hard for Jesus. That's a good thing. He also says, I know your perseverance. Now more on the passive side. You're persevering. You're, you're patiently enduring. 
That in the midst of your hard labor, you're pressing on. In the midst of your setbacks, you're still pressing on. In the midst of your persecution that we've covered the last three weeks, you're still pressing on. You're persevering, and that's good. They worked hard. They persevered. Still in verse 2, they didn't tolerate evil men. Kind of ironic that if you're a patient church, you tend to be overly patient with people and anything that comes is almost acceptable for you. But what Jesus says about this church is that when evil comes into your midst, you don't have patience with that. You don't tolerate that. In regards to evil, you don't play fast and loose with it. Verse 2 says that they didn't tolerate evil men. It's repeated again in verse 6 that they had a hatred for the deeds of the Nicolaitans. So you get this impression that the church is a light in the midst of a dark pagan culture, but the darkness was encroaching on the church, which is true in any church. And instead of accepting the darkness as, you know what, we just want to tolerate the darkness because that's who we are nowadays, they would realize that people that were committing unrepentant sins, refusing to repent of their sins, they were being dealt with. They were being rebuked. They were being disciplined out of the church. They were being asked to leave. They don't tolerate evil. They hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans because God says, I hate those deeds. And if God hates something, we as a church should hate it as well. We don't hate the people, but we hate the deeds. If we're a light for Jesus Christ in the community, we can't have evil persisting in our midst or else it ruins the light. The church is a holy place. We all sin. We don't deny that. But the bottom line is the church is made up of sinners, but yet repentant sinners. So that when people look at us, they see Christ. They don't see sin. They don't see hypocrisy. They don't see people that say they claim to believe the Bible and teach one thing, but they live their lives contrary. It will kill our light. It will kill our testimony. And Jesus is saying, you're doing a great job in that area. The town is morally bad. The town is theologically evil. And you're not tolerating that in your church. That's how it should be. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. You hate the things I hate, you love the things that I love. That's how a church should be. Another subpoint, verse 2, they also tested false apostles. I believe this is a kind of a, a, a subsection of the category of evil men. Now, this is not obviously the original 12 apostles because at this point, around A.D. 90 or so, um, John was the only guy still alive. All the rest were martyred for their faith. There are no more apostles in that sense. There were 12, and that's it. But what you had back then was you had these itinerant teachers. You had, and we're going to get to more of this probably later on, you had these traveling teachers that were always making their circuits. Uh, there wasn't a lot of people to teach the word back then. They didn't have the Bible like we have today. So you, you really relied upon traveling teachers. And when a teacher came and knocked on your door and said, I will teach to your church now if you want me to, they tested these guys. They checked them out on their theology. They checked them out on their lifestyle. They didn't just give the pulpit or the Sunday school class to anyone that walked by. You say, why was it called apostle then? Because apostle, the Greek word is apostoleo, which means a sent one. That's all it means. So it's kind of a, we call it the small a apostles. Anyone that goes out that's sent out to proclaim the gospel is in a sense a small a apostle. And they, they, they check these guys out. They tested these guys out before they allowed them to speak to the church. They didn't stand for any error. Again, great praise from the Lord. And again, it's amazing when we live in a day and age when the highest virtue today is tolerance, that this church was doubly praised for, in a sense, at times, being intolerant. What an incredible cry for most churches today. What an incredible cry that, that bend over backwards to, to succumb to the, 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 the worldly pressure that we need to embrace and tolerate ungodly actions and ungodly lifestyles. Jesus is saying here is, you match things up with what my word says and what's bad, you call bad. You are patient with people. I don't see a hint of them being self-righteous in any way. You are patient with people. You call people to repent. When they refuse to repent, you deal with that individual. You don't let sin continually permeate the church because a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough, does it not? Right? All right. Last sub point, number five, verse three. Speaks of their perseverance and their endurance, but adds a very interesting phrase. Jesus says you do it for my name's sake. Another good thing. You guys are being persecuted. 
We learned about that. It was going to get worse for this church. It was going to get really ugly under Roman leaders. I mean, bad, really bad. You're persevering. They, they worked hard. They're, they're doing that. It wasn't just that they were dealing with life as life throws us awful curveballs all the time and persevering it like anybody apart from Christ has to do. They were persevering for the things that they were doing for Jesus. They went through a lot. And Jesus says, you know what? I know you're doing it for my name's sake. It'd be a lot easier if you just kicked back and didn't serve in the church. It'd be a lot easier if you guys didn't confront sin. Not a whole lot of people that I confront in sin when they come back and say, hey, thanks for that. I really need to hear that. It's oftentimes confrontational. They did it. It's the dirty work that no one wants to do. They did what they had to do. It resulted in persecution. They were a light for Jesus in the community. It resulted in persecution. And they were doing it simply because they wanted to be faithful. And Jesus says, I see that. I walk amongst the lampstand. I see what's going on there. You're doing it for my namesake. And I appreciate the pain that you're enduring simply because you're trying to bear the cross for me. Verse 3 closes it by saying, you've not grown weary. Amazing. All they endured, they never entertained the thought of giving up. One commentator said, they labor to the point of weariness without the weariness ever setting in. So far, this is good stuff, isn't it? I wonder how many churches in America can even say they're doing half of those things. I wonder what Jesus would say about our church regarding those particular things. And you might be saying, wait, I feel a little bit uh, confused because you told me this was going to be a negative example. That sounds like a positive example to me. Well, they had, they had just one problem. And as I said, it was just, it was just a little problem. And Jesus is going to tell them that problem right now. Very brief, but he isolates it. Critical concern he has against his church in verse 4. He says, Despite all those good things that I see, um, I got this against you. You've left your first love. That's the problem. To the outward eye, Ephesus, you guys look great. But you've left your first love. So the second point, Christ's, Christ's condemn, or third point, Christ's condemnation. It's been said that um, when there's ever any movement that the first generation will oftentimes die for it, the second generation will live for it, and the third generation will kill it. They didn't live very long back then. So there were a lot of generations that passed within 40 years, and I bet you it was probably three generations. Church is founded. The first generation is doing really well. They love Jesus. They're doing great. Great, 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 great fervor, great passion for Christ. But the next generation, a little less. Third generation now, 40 years later, not demonstrating the same faith as their forefathers. Slowly, gradually, they departed from their original position and their devotion to the Savior. This church was not the same church it was when the Apostle Paul founded it. They put their service to the Lord ahead of their love for the Lord. If I can read in this letter correctly, they base their success merely on how outwardly active they were and not the internal affections of the heart. If I can read in this letter, I see they performed robotic service with a cool heart for Christ. If I can read this letter, I see they replaced the love for Jesus with a love for the things of this world. If I read in this letter, I see that they valued the blessings from the person more than they valued the person himself. We all have periods in our life, folks, where we kind of cool off for Jesus. That's a true reality. The problem was this whole church cooled off, and they weren't coming back. Beloved, the first command for a Christian is not get up and start doing stuff. The first command for a Christian is be, love, cherish. and then let him do the stuff through you. Warren Wearsby said, the local church is espoused to Christ, but there's always the danger of that church and that love in that church growing cold. Like Martha, we're familiar with her. 
We can be so busy working for Christ that we have no time to love him. Christ is more concerned about what we do with him than for him. Labor is no substitute for love. To the public, the Ephesian church was successful. To Christ, it had fallen. John Wolvert said this in his commentary, though the church maintained a high level of service, they were lacking in deep devotion to Christ. How the church today needs to heed this warning that orthodoxy and service are not enough. Christ wants the believer's hearts as well as their hands and their heads. You've lost your first love. That chase, pure devotion for the newlywed bride. The word used for love is agape. That's the deepest Greek word that we have to express the most meaningful way we can define love in an action-passionate sense. Paul called it in 2 Corinthians 10, a simple and pure devotion to Christ. Jesus simply called it the greatest commandment that the most important thing for us as Christians is to love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our soul, and all our might, and that was absent in this Ephesian church. Let me see if I can provide an illustration for you. As I wrote in my blog, I, I hope you read that about a month ago, God's divine design for marriage, that everything we see in marriage is there for a specific reason. The purpose of marriage between a husband and a wife, according to Ephesians chapter 5, is to mirror the union between Jesus and his bride. It is to give the world a visible illustration of the gospel. That's ultimately why we have marriage. That when people see you and your spouse, that they see Jesus and the church, that they see the gospel. That's the primary purpose. And then every command out of marriage flows out of that and perfectly makes sense. Why do we leave our mother and father and why are we cleave then to our wife? Because when we come to Jesus, we leave all other competitors in that sense. We leave all other allegiances in that sense. We break the cord of dependency to the rest of the world and we follow Jesus first and foremost. Why does God hate divorce? Because would Jesus ever divorce the church? Would the church ever divorce Jesus? Why are we one flesh with our spouse? Because we are one with Christ when we receive him as Lord and Savior. He is in us, we are in him. Why does marriage have to be between one man and one woman? Because it's one church that married one Savior. One man, one woman, showing the church You can't mess with that because you mess with that, you mess with the gospel. That's the way God designed it. So, with that understanding, let's take it from a divine marriage. We are the bride of Christ, that is the church. Jesus is the bridegroom. And let's put it at a human marriage level that I think will make sense of the problem going on in Ephesus. Wives, How would you feel if your husband did everything for you merely out of a sense of duty? On paper, he's a a great husband. He fixes things around the house on time, cuts the grass, brings you flowers for Valentine's Day, works hard, supports the family financially, But in the midst of all of his mechanical responsibilities, he never looked at you, never gazed into your eyes, never touched you, and never said he loved you. Ladies, would that service mean anything to you? On the contrary, how would you feel, ladies, if behind his service there was a spirit of delight in you? Passion for you as his Precious bride, a joy and desire to simply make you happy, a love that increases for you over time. That's the way it's supposed to be. So now if I take it from a human illustration, which I think we would all agree with, why is it so hard to figure out this thing from a spiritual perspective? Does Jesus think of his church any different? When there's a whole lot of good stuff going on, but there's no love, there's no passion, there's no affection. 
There's no such thing as honeymoon love unless we define that as puppy love. That's not true love. That's the kind of love that's hot one minute and cold the next minute. I don't get honeymoon love. I mean, does that imply that the greatest love that we are to have for our spouse is at the very beginning? Maybe the first few months of marriage at best, and after that it's simply just downhill from there? Shouldn't it be just the opposite? Shouldn't my honeymoon with my spouse simply be the beginning and then through the years of getting to know each other and exploring each other and laughing together and crying together and communicating that my love for her and her love for me should grow within time? Shouldn't the greatest love for my wife not be at the beginning but rather at the end of our marriage? As one is laying the other into our Savior's arms? We see oftentimes as a person gets saved and they're filled with joy. It's honeymoon time, right? All their sins have been taken away. The guilt's been removed. They're reconciled to the holy living God. And then the honeymoon ends for the Christian. And with the honeymoon goes the zeal and the passion. I hope that's not the case. Does it not stand to reason that the longer I walk with Christ, the greater my love for him should increase? Does it stand to reason that the more I spend in his word and the more I am able through his word to gaze upon his beautiful attributes and learn him in greater and deeper ways that I should love him more? Doesn't it stand to reason that the more I speak to him in prayer, the deeper our relationship should grow? Doesn't it stand to reason that the more he takes me through trials and I look back and say, man, he has been faithful every single time that I'll trust him more in the future? Shouldn't the love for Jesus grow when I realize that he is a God who is faithful and can always be trusted? And that the more I grow in Christ's likeness, the more I start taking on the image of Jesus Christ, the more I realize this is good. But too often we see the opposite. In our human marriages and in our divine marriage. It's not what God wants. God said through the prophet Jeremiah to the loveless Israel, go and proclaim in the ears of Jerusalem saying, thus says the Lord, I remember concerning you the devotion of your youth, the love of your betrothals. You're following after me in the wilderness. And he's saying, Israel, what happened? Where'd it go? What we learn from this rebuke to the church in Ephesus is that God does not want religion. He wants first and foremost, a relationship, right? And this church was really, really good at the religious part, but they were horrible at the relationship part. How does it happen? We got to ask that question, how does it happen? How do you lose your first, how do you stop loving Jesus? I can tell you it wasn't his problem, his fault. He's not a bad husband who did something wrong and you kind of just got to keep loving him to stay married. He didn't do anything wrong. He's never once committed a sin against you. Why do we stop loving him? The answer is, is, is that it's very subtle. It doesn't, it doesn't happen overnight. It's, it's the flesh that we all battle with on a regular basis. That's still that, that unredeemed part of our humanity that we're called to crucify on a daily basis. It, the, it's the flesh that just takes advantage of our natural laziness and negligence. And what we start doing is we start laying aside the spiritual disciplines. They're not that important. You don't have to read the word every day. You know, kids got things going on Sunday mornings. That's okay. Church, you know, you're not going to go to hell because you miss church. And we get this attitude that we think we're convinced that we can just simply get along with God without being with God. We don't, at least I've not seen it much in my 18 years as a pastor. We're not fully apostatizing. I've, I've, I've seen very few in 18 years that just said, you know what, Pastor? I'm done with the Jesus stuff. I'm out of it. I'm going back to the world. Most people would admit that's not the way to go. 
The decision I made when I was a pagan really didn't bring me a lot of happiness. There wasn't a lot of satisfaction and fulfillment out there. Most of us are like, I don't want to just throw away the potential that I, there might be a hell someday. So I'm just going to kind of hold on. Keep going with the spiritual duties. There's no fear for God. There's no reverence for God. There's no love for God anymore. There's no relationship. I'm just going to go through the motions. My heart's never fully engaged. You know, I'll show up at church. I'll tinker with the ministry now and then. Throw some of my leftovers in the offering plate. Keep the Christian vocabulary moving on in my life and conversation with other people. Spiritual growth just ceases. It starts to go backwards. My passion for Christ slides. It's replaced with a reliance on self and a trust in the wisdom of this world. And I appear still religious. I still feel religious. I still look morally impressive to the rest of the people in this world, but I basically have no private communion with Jesus anymore. And what Jesus is saying, you could be doing all the great things in the world, but your religion is worthless. What happened now happened back then. 2,000 years ago, this Ephesian church, believe it or not, started well. In Paul's letter to the Ephesians, he said this, Ephesians 1.15, For this reason I too, having heard of the faith, your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, which exists among you, and your love for all the saints. This was a loving church. The apostle Paul wrote that you love Jesus and you love Christians. What happened? Where'd the love go? Because folks, without love, which is the royal commandment, the greatest commandment, we cease to be a church. You get rid of love, we're not a church anymore. I don't care how good the doctrine is. I don't care how cool the worship is. If we don't have love, we're nothing, right? Love for Christ, love for others. The two greatest commandments. So, verse 5, Christ is going to correct them. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, and repent, and do the deeds you did at first. Let's look at these briefly. First of all, remember. Memory is a powerful force. Think back to the good days, Ephesians. Think back. Are you really happier now? Now that you've lost your love for me, Jesus says, are you really happier in the world? Is is it really working for you? Go back to the good days. When we walked hand in hand. When I was your motivation to get out of bed every morning. When you had purpose and satisfaction and we had communion, sweet communion, throughout the entire day together. Do you remember that when the worship was so sweet and I was just there on the forefront of your tongue and the forefront of your mind? Do you remember that? Do you remember those days when you as a church would get together and you're singing praise to Jesus as you're serving him and sharing your faith? Remember those good days? Don't keep wallowing in this unfulfilling lifestyle. I'm like the prodigal father. Return to me, son. I'm here to forgive. I'm here to receive you back. Look at how far you've fallen away. Remember, second, repent. Uh, Literally, that means to to change the mind. I'm over here. You're going this way. It means do a 180. Turn around. Realize what you're doing wrong. Make a break with the sin. Renounce the loveless attitude. Reject the loveless attitude. And then third, repeat. Repeat. Repeat what you did in the past. Turn from evil and turn back to righteousness. Do the actions you formerly did, he says here. The actions that that came from a pure devotion to Christ. And it's interesting, if you look at this text right here, it does not say, love as you first did. It says, do the deeds that you first did. It's, It's interesting. It's because the average person, the average church says, oh, I guess the deeds must be bad. We're just going to be the loving church then and not the deeds church because anyone that just does deeds, that's bad. Jesus rebukes those kind of churches. No. He says, keep the deeds going, but do them with the right heart. 
Don't just crank it out with me on the sidelines. Have communion with me and allow me to work through you as you do those deeds. Jesus told us, if you love me, you'll do what I say. We prove our love with the deeds. Didn't God do that? For God so loved the world, period. I'm glad it doesn't end there. For God so loved the world that he what? He gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not die but have everlasting life. Keep serving. But do it with the right heart. Now, it's kind of an encouraging way to end, but I can't end there because the text keeps going. You see it? It says, or else. It's a good line for a parent, right? You're doing great. Got this one thing against you. Here's what you got to do. What if I don't do it, Dad? <laughs> or else. We're going to have problems. Jesus will not continue to strive with an unrepentant, unloving church. Or else, verse 5, I am coming to you. There's a good parent line as well, right? I am coming to you, and I will remove your lampstand out of its place. What does that mean? It means that Jesus is long-suffering and slow to anger and slow to patience, but there comes a time when it's done. We see that throughout all of the Bible. Enough is enough. You are a lampstand. That means you are a light to the world. You are a lighthouse to the world. You're an instrument where I am choosing to make myself visible. I'm choosing to show that I am good and I'm someone that people need to trust. I'm using you, church, to be a light unto the dark world. But if you're going to be committed to darkness yourself, I will take my light elsewhere. What this is saying here is that every church can lose its capacity to bear light. And the one who controls the church, verse 1, is the one who will remove the light from that church, verse 5, if she fails in her responsibilities. Remove the lampstand, the testimony of that church ceases to exist. You see, didn't Jesus say that he's going to build his church, Matthew 16? Of course. He's just not going to use you to do it. He was the church that wants to be a light. What it means is, 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 um, is they're losing the presence of Jesus. That he's departed. Just like when, the, when, when God departed from the temple of Israel. Remember that? It's still a building. It's still a temple. They still come and do their things, but God was gone. In the same way, there's a lot of churches, especially churches that are engaged in so much stuff apart from a love for Jesus that he leaves. And the sad thing is, I don't know if some of these churches even miss him because business just keeps going on as normal. Church might still be there, but you're just going to be an empty shell. This will happen unless you repent. Total destruction of the church because a loveless attitude in a church cannot continue. Without love, a church ceases to be a church. And this warning gave this church a glimmer of hope. Jesus said, there's still time. Repent. Return to your first love. Sadly, this warning was not heeded, history tells us. It was tragically fulfilled in regards to this Ephesian church a few centuries later. The church failed to exist, and even now there is no church in the town of Ephesus. We've got a lot to learn from this example to this Ephesian church. I encourage you, brothers and sisters, as I speak to myself here, don't take your eyes off Jesus. You must be engaged in the spiritual disciplines. You must be in the Word. You must be in prayer. You must be fellowshipping with other Christians. You must be sharing your faith. You must be serving in the local body. You must be doing that or else you are going to drift away from Christ. Abide in Christ. Keep your eyes upon Jesus, not the news reports, the newspaper, the current trends, the popular opinion. Don't do that. What the flesh desires, don't do that. Keep your eyes fixed upon Christ. Keep your eyes focused in the Word. This is truth, Jesus said. John 17, 17. Focus on truth, not lies. Satan is the father of lies. Also, may our love for him grow stronger as we walk with him daily. Let me ask you, where is your love for Jesus right now? 
Is it stronger than it was a year ago? If not, are you guilty of this? Are you losing your first love? And in all that we do, may we individually and corporately as a church remember that Jesus is preeminent over all things and that his greatest commandment to us is that we love him. And isn't that encouraging? He's not some distant God, but he's a God that's amongst us, walking amongst us, knowing everything we're thinking, caring for his church, sustaining his church, nurturing his church, and saying what I want from you more than anything else is for you to love me. And he is not only worthy of our love, but he is so lovable. Don't lose it. Let's pray. I'd like to call up our prayer partners right now too. If you can come up, please. Father, we um, covered a lot today and do pray if there's anyone here today that does not know you as Lord and Savior, maybe they don't even have a relationship with you. They have no idea what I'm talking about and much of this doesn't uh, obviously apply to them. They've never even, they've never lost their first love because they've never had a relationship with Jesus who is love. Pray today that you would work in their hearts and enable them to believe upon Jesus today and confess him as Lord, to realize that he paid the penalty for all of their sins on the cross and that when we come to him simply by faith alone, that Jesus will forgive our sins. It's a message of grace. It's a, it's a free gift of eternal life. Pray that you are giving people faith in response to your word today to receive Christ. And if they need to talk to someone, that they would talk to Lester and Leanne that are up here right now after church. If there's someone here that is struggling that might just need prayer or might want to confess some sin um, or might want some greater understanding of what we talked about, I, I encourage you as well, come up and talk to Lester and Leanne. They would be happy to speak with you. Lord, help us as a church to grow in this area. May we be people that show a fervent love for you. The fruit of the Spirit is love. Without love, 1 Corinthians 13, we know we are nothing. You are a God of love. God is love. When we abide in you, the most dominant thing that should come out is holiness and love, a holy love. Father, may we be manifesting that fruit in our hearts, going back to you, receiving love fully from you as we abide in Christ, giving that love back to you, and then sharing that love horizontally with other people in our lives. Father, please examine our hearts as we examine our own hearts and impress upon us individually as a church if we need to grow in this particular area. May we never lose Jesus Christ as our first love. In his name we pray, amen, amen.